We said it before and we'll say it again. We are the ones we've been waiting for. The Lovest Campaign allows us to show up for one another. Together, we can fund the Healing Revolution collectively, one donation at a time. We are proud to have covered the cost of over 6 million in therapy sessions since 2019. But with the demand of our services skyrocketing, we need to do more. As we embark on our fourth year of making mental health resources accessible, we're placing our faith and optimism in our community by setting a bold impact goal. From now until December, we are rallying 1 million supporters to contribute just $5 each. If we succeed, we'll significantly expand our reach and provide $5 million in therapy to Black women, girls, and non-binary folks in 2025. This campaign is about Black women pulling our resources together to build a grassroots, for us, by us movement. Join the Love Us campaign. Visit thelovelandfoundation.org to join our movement of $1 million by making a $5 donation today. Dr. Raquel Martin is a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, scientist, and podcast host on the mission to radically reimagine Black possibility. She promotes Black mental health as a key to legacy building and longevity. As a professor and scientist at Tennessee State University, she teaches numerous courses, including psychology of the Black experience in hip-hop, activism, and mental health. Dr. Martin's research and publications focus on Black identity development as a bridge to STEAM development and a shield against mental health difficulties. Additionally, Dr. Martin's private practice, Martin Psychological Services, focuses on Black mental health. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Unfolding, presented by the Love and Foundation. I'm your host, Rachel Keener, and today we're joined by the wonderful Dr. Martin. Hi, Dr. Martin. How are you doing today? I am fantastic. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. I've been catching up all about you, doing some light stalking on the, what you're all about and <laughs> you know, casual. Um, and you talk a lot about safe spaces. So I just figured it'd be fun to open up with this first question. Like, what is your safe space? And like, what does it mean to you in your healing journey? I I feel like a safe space is anywhere that I don't have to mask or code switch. Mm-hmm. Um a lot of times people talk about code switching, like going back and forth between language. But what I find that they're actually doing is masking, creating whole avatars of themselves because they don't feel comfortable being who they are behind closed doors around other people. Uh, so I find that any space where I don't feel the need to um, change my tone, um, check and recheck the way I'm engaging with others, uh, things that provide me with an, a, an environment that will humanize me and will respect who I am. In, in any realm, whether that's on a good day or a bad day, as long as I'm being respectful. Uh, I think a lot of times there, there are pretty, there are a lot of differences among people. And I always say that I don't have to agree with you to respect the humanity in you and, um, mm. and to humanize you in the first place. So I would say my safe space is any place where I don't feel the need to mask and my whole self is welcomed. Love that. Do you find that is certain people you feel safer around or like certain environments that create that safe space or is it kind of like the perfect blend of the two? Um, I feel like it used to be certain people, um, mm-hmm. but my my training to to be a psychologist was, you know, academia is incredibly elitist and um, it's very hard to be Black in the ivory of academia. And that experience taught me that it really honed in on the aspect of like, I you know, can't drop my weapon when my skin is what is feared. Like for the longest, mm-hmm. I think I used to play into the aspect of respectability, politics, and tone policing. But then I realized um, through experience uh, that it's not just about like what you say. It's not what you say or how you say it. A lot of times it's who's saying it. And I think there are certain messages or uh, individuals, whether it's individual people or environments that just had an issue with the intellect or the confidence coming from a vessel that looked like me. Yeah. So I have felt as though since you're going to have a problem either way, you might as well have a problem and it be my true full self. You know, like I might as well, if you're going to have an issue with water down Raquel, I might as well give you the, <laughs> the, 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 the concentrate baby minute all day. So like, I think it used to be that thought process that like, Oh, you know, acting a certain way, behaving a certain way. Until I realized, like, oh, you just got a problem with me. And if you mm-hmm. have a problem with me, I want you to have a problem with the real me. Yes, so here exactly. you go. Um, I know some individuals are, are are in this space where it's like, you know, it's 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 going to be behaving a certain way in different environments. But 
I, I, I think, and I, people would be able to let me know, I, I, be, I believe I behave the same way in all environments, whether that's to my detriment or not. Like, I, I also think you have to be aware that, like, with people that can, that can have consequences and you have to decide if the consequences are worth it. And I've gotten to a space where I think the consequences are worth it. And consequences Ooh. aren't just negative or positive. Like it could be the negative consequence of people being like, oh, I don't want you in this space and you're not someone I want to collab with because you don't want to put on the mask that I think you need to. Or it can be the positive consequences of people being like, I want to work with you because you make me feel seen and I don't have to worry about um, you being fake because that's just not of you. So consequences aren't just negative or positive. But you, and it's not something that you should have to deal with. Everyone doesn't have to deal with the consequences of being authentic. But I've gotten to a space where I'm cool with it. Like you're going to either love me for me or hate me for me, but it's going to be me and it's going to be earned either way. Yeah, yeah. Just showing up as like your authentic self. And that's something I noticed while like going through your profiles, like she's showing up as her. And that's yeah. like the most beautiful <laughs> Like she's gonna be her, <laughs> and I admire that because it's something like I've been working on. Like my own like personal goal this year is to like be more vulnerable and like not be masked up all the time. You know, like obviously COVID, yes, be masked up, but like be like masked in like the sense of like hiding who I am or like hiding my thoughts or hiding like how I truly feel. Because like I think you're conditioned to like present a certain way, especially like the way that like. I grew up going to like a lot of PWIs and like being in spaces Mm -hmm. like that, like just having to like unlearn so much and being exhausted by like things I have to like, like, dang, I got to work on that too. Like just another thing I be mindful of. And just like, I saw that you, um, you are a black liberation psychologist and like, Mm -hmm. how did that, like how do you show up in a space where we talk about psychology being like in this elitist thing it's very like white coded white supremacy code and like we're tr- at the foundation we're trying to break the like myth that like therapy and mental health is like a white people thing or like it's only yeah. for it's like a luxury item so like seeing that you were a black liberation psychologist it's like oh like that sounds like amazing <laughs> but that also sounds like you had to forge a path that was like probably very hard so like what is a black liberation psychologist so people can know and then also like how that changed your perspective on psychology and what it means to you and your community? Um, I was lucky that I don't think I would have been a psychologist if I didn't take my first psychology course at Fisk University, which is HBCU in Nashville. Of course, we studied some of the European American individuals, but we also were able to study Kenneth and maybe Phipps, Phipps Clark and African Centered Psychology. And I've been graced with being able to have conversation with liberation psychologists such as Dr. Tama Bryant and Dr. Erlinger Turner. And um, liberation psychology, it it transcends traditional therapy. Um, It incorporates the soul and the spirit into healing, which is so important for the Black community. And it's about addressing internal wounds and oppression to unlock joy and purpose um, by providing like a freedom for individuals and community. Uh, And I, I find it to be particularly vital in supporting Black people, like the diverse experiences in the Black community, because the, some of the most important aspects of psychology, liberation psychology, focus on joy and purpose and living a life of freedom um, without being mm-hmm. bogged down by oppression and adultification and dehumanization. And I think that's, in, that's it, it's not only about addressing the wounds of internalized oppression, but it's also about reimagining possibilities for like individuals and families and communities. Um, a lot of times I hear people say things like, I'm breaking generational curses. And I, I think liberation psychology is also about the the impact of building generational bonds. And that's always, that's always resonated with me um, because I find that it's not enough to just talk about what's happening in session. The liberation psychology also talks about um, what's happening outside of session. As a liberation psychologist, mm-hmm. I expect to be, to, for people to address like, what's the impact of discrimination and prejudice on mental health? Um, my intersecting identities are being a Black woman who is a mother who has had um, birth trauma. What do you know about these terms and how are you going to bring that into session with me, right? Like it's it's delving deeper in understanding the full gambit of the Black experience because sometimes I think people focus only solely, even if they do focus on this, like the oppression and the racism. But Black people are yeah. so much more. Um, the enslavement of Africans is more, you know, European American history than it is ours. That is just one aspect of who we are, you know? So I just very much think it's about, it's it's more of a holistic approach and it considers the whole soul um, of individuals mm-hmm. just going behind the thoughts and the feelings and behaviors. And I think it, it focuses on the diversity of the Black experience and we deserve it. No, we deserve to feel safe and feel joy and feel liberation like yeah just as much as anyone else and like 
that really ties into like this concept of like the black identity and like everyone assuming that like the black identity is so like sad and like there's just nothing but trauma like yes there is like a like, there's trauma that like not to negate that but like yeah there's also like so much like vibrant history and love and joy and like leaning into that um and just like the role the black identity plays in like just psychology and just overall wellness and so like creating safe spaces for like our identity like how we do that but you talked about like breaking generational curses and this stuff and seeing that you talk a lot about like black mental wealth and like creating like generational wealth so like how in that space is like what is black mental wealth like how would you define that I think Black mental wealth encompasses the gambit of emotional well-being, self-care, whether it goes to like financial self-care or emotional self-care or environmental self-care. I think it has to do with being able to be authentic in who you are and then advocate for yourself in a realm and having support in that aspect of it. Um, when When I think about it, I think of creating safe space for identity, for your, who you are and creating a healthy legacy. But I think a lot of times people think of legacy and they mix it up with lineage. Like lineage, of course, is your relationships and your relatives. And, you know, I have children and, you know, but legacy um, is related to your experience. Legacy can, it is about what you leave behind as a person, but not only like physical things. It's also about how do you leave people um, after having engagements with you and after having encounters with you? Like, is your legacy the fact that like every time somebody hung out with me, they were like, oh my gosh, what a stank attitude, you know, <laughs> or like, <laughs> is, is my legacy the aspect of like, every time I hung out with Dr. Martin, I felt seen, you know, every time I hung out with Raquel, I felt as though she understood me and she made it a point to um, focus in on our engagement and our relationship. So I think Black uh, mental wealth is also looking at the fact that your children are, are not only your legacy, um, your legacy isn't limited to children, your legacy is also how you leave this world, how you leave people feeling. Uh, And I I think it's important to state that because a lot of times I think there's this generational aspect of, you know, there's always stressors between generations, but I think it's, there's a significant stress that I've seen um, with my patients of feeling stressors of their parents stating that like, you're my legacy, you're what I'm leaving behind. Mm -hmm. And I think that Um, limits, yeah, (laughs) that limits parents parents to thinking that it's just like, you know, it's not too late for you to build your legacy. Your legacy is built every single day. A lot of times I think parents feel as though they missed out on something. So they want their children to have it. They feel as though the only way to achieve a goal is through their children because they think it's too late for them. And when I think Mm -hmm. of black mental wealth, I want people to realize that it's never too late for you to achieve a goal or identify a goal. And your children may be one aspect of your legacy, but they're not all of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, your children, as some as, as, as some sense of it, like you, you're supposed to be emboldening your children with certain values, and you're supposed to have this expectation that you know, understanding that you know, I did what I was supposed to do, and I worked with them, but they're 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 of me, but they are not me. So yeah, they got to take these values with them, and I got to hope <laughs> that like they're able to forge their own path. I'm not supposed to think that like. I have to, they're an extension of me, meaning that like everything they do represents me. They're the whole people. Um, and I think there's a freedom in that. I think if more people acknowledge the fact that children actually are are, are not the, the whole aspect of their legacy, um, they would back off their kids a little bit and let them, you know, be themselves. It's just like, well, you're a representative of me. No, mom, I'm a representative of me, you know? So like me getting pink hair or me deciding not to go to college or me, um, Engage, engaging in um, non-monogamous relationships or be being um, queer that has nothing to do with you because I am my yeah. own person and I think that's I think that connects to the disconnect between generations so I think black mental wealth is embodying the fact that mm-hmm. um, we are able to be ourselves uh, health and well-being are things that we deserve and going forward with that aspect of it oh I love that I so I noticed you work with youth. And so is there anything about like youth that you work with that like you're excited about or that you're noticing like ways that like you need, they need support, like things you've noticed from the, in the mental health world aspect? Yeah, I feel like I have a benefit of working in so many different realms. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, so I'm seeing individuals in therapy. I'm a full-time professor of Tennessee State University, so I'm able to work with individuals in undergrad and grad school when it yeah. comes to um, their well-being. I'm also a scientist who gets to look at like the data and collect research studies about children and and adults across the the lifespan. Um, 
So I feel like I'm at and yeah, and social media and stuff like that. So I, I feel like um something that I'm noticing is that not even just with youth, but across the lifespan, um, individuals are really honing in and, and leaning into the aspect of black identity development. Yeah. And acknowledging the fact that it happens across the lifespan. So I think a lot of times when it happens with identity, people think of like childhood or when they think of developmental norms and stuff like that, they think of youth. Um, but I find that my, my patients or kiddos that are younger are asking themselves questions as well as my students in undergrad, as well as my adult patients that I'm working with about things that help to contribute to their well-being and understanding that there's fluidity in that. Um, because Black identity development, it's, it's an integral part of well-being. Like a, a strong Black identity is a protective factor against substance use and uh, substance abuse and mental health difficulties. And it contributes to the development of greater self-esteem and higher academic achievement and stronger moral development. And I find that more people are getting comfortable with their agency in that realm of understanding that there are so many different aspects of their identity, whether they're Gen Z and a mom or Gen Z and a non-binary person or Gen X or millennials and have just become parents or going to school later in life. They're understanding that there's fluidity in that identity um, and it's able to change and they have agency over that. Um, So I I will say that one thing that I'm noticing is more people are focusing on their aspect of their culture and what their culture means to them. And I really like the fact that we're more so focusing on the diversity within the Black experience, because um, one of the things that contributes to the breakdown of Black identity is the expecting Black people to be a monolith. Like that in itself is an oppressive environment. So I I like the fact that more people are comfortable stating, even as they're getting older, because it's not even just Gen Z, as they're getting older, being like, you know, Like when I was growing up, that was something I wasn't able to do. But if it's something that I've learned or if it's something that my children are teaching me or even that my students are teaching me, like they'll be like, it's okay for me to be like, it's enough for me. And I want to do it this way. Um, So I really I'm I'm appreciating seeing that across the lifespan in science is with my patients, with my students, like I've been in my encounters with my, my family and friends, even on social media, like people commenting on stuff like that, being like, this has really opened up my my thought process to be like, what does my identity mean to me? Mm. But not just as a woman, but as a black woman, or not just as a man, but as a non-binary black person, or not just as um, as, as a, a black man in this world, but a black man in this world who is um, struggling with forming relationships with others. Like when I'll post videos, they'll be like, you know what? I never thought about the stereotypes within the black male community and how that's kind of the baseline of my identity. I think I got to think yeah. about that now. <laughs> so I like the fact that people are slowing down and asking themselves questions and focusing on, you know, what their answer is. They have to know their answer more than worrying about what other people's questions are for them. I like that. I feel like Black identity, like, for so long, is, like, something that, like, people have given to you. Like, oh, you're a Black woman. You're a dark-skinned Black woman. You're a mm-hmm. big Black woman. Like, you're, like, it's, like, where... You, you like start to like the lines like here's what I'm choosing as my identity because like your identity is self like you you make your own identity so like yeah. how does one like build a black identity like a healthy black identity I think it comes in with a lot of different things and I'm actually trying to work on a, a conceptual model myself because I, I think that um focusing on the things that break down this aspect of feeling like yourself um, which often contributes to racism related stress um, and then yeah. thinking of the that build it, right? Like things that contribute to the breakdown of your Black identity and experiencing racism related stress are stereotypes and systemic inequality and the expectation to be a monolith and being in an oppressive environment and having lack of representation. Things that contribute to building that are cultural education and the aspect of educational empowerment, just the epitome of Educational empowerment provides us the aspect specifically with Black people of like, I know who I am, so I know who I'm not. So there's the whole thought process of thinking Mm -hmm. that enslavement is the only thing that contributes to the Black people. That is going to contribute to a breakdown of Black identity development. Um, So I I focus on educational empowerment, um, addressing and challenging stereotypes, um, having this aspect of cultural celebrations. Um, I very much think that when it comes to Black people, being agents of change is really important um, because there are a lot of factors that I've noticed in patients and students that are signs that their Black identity is being attacked and they're suffering from racism-related stress. Like it's the racism-related stress is starting to chip away at the well-being of them. Um, And I I feel like I've noticed certain things that contribute to that and uh, trying to help them work through that as well. When you're with like patients, how are you able to treat 
stress that like we feel like just as human beings and then like on top of that treating like racism related like, stress like how do you hold space for both and like how i can imagine like how to exist with like both exist at the same time you know so how yeah. do you even get to address that you know I think it's really hard to dissect this, the two when it comes to Black people, but I, the biggest tool is going to be me in the room. So the difference between a Black patient getting a, getting a diagnosis of like PTSD and an oppositional defiant disorder is the is the assessor, is the mental health professional who comes from them. Wow. And we're only as good as the information we take in, right? Um, so it's, it's my job to look at and like, assessments and interviews and fiction and nonfiction books and documentaries and stuff and, and continuing education credits that center the black experience as someone who focuses on black mental health and um and that deal with liberation so that I can know what I'm seeing was sitting across from me, right? Because if I don't take the time to hone in on my craft because I am in fact the tool, I'm gonna miss it. Right. Like I'm gonna miss the fact that like this powerlessness that you're stating um, is actually as a result of feeling no control over your experience because you, mm-hmm. you're in an oppressive work environment. Or I'll I'll miss the, the the fact that you're experiencing traumatic stress. Like I'll think it's due to um, the world. But if I don't ask the right questions, it's not only due to the world, it's due to the emotional and psychological and spiritual, spiritual strain that is caused by exposure to racism and discrimination and oppression. So if I miss that, I'll think that you have to deal with, oh, your PTSD, let's deal with some general things instead of being like, um, well, this actually has to do specifically with the fact that you're taking in a lot of, you're a, an activist and you're a part of that is being in the movement. And in being in that movement, you're, it's a part of your job to ingest um, data that has to deal with Black pain and Black trauma. And that's causing you to, of course, have an aspect of resistance fatigue, right? Like if I don't understand what I'm looking at, if I don't take in the time to look at research and narratives and individuals about what they're dealing with in the Black experience, I would see someone um, stressed out in an environment as having imposter syndrome instead of seeing them mm. as having a justified response to an oppressive environment, right? And those are two different things because when you hear imposter syndrome, a lot of the times people are like, okay, that's something that you have to work on individually. Like, what, like what's, what's going on inside you? But when you hear you're having a justified response to an oppressive relationship that is making you, that is making you feel unwelcome, they're doing everything Ooh. in their power to do that, that means you got to work on the relationship. Yeah, that's not something you can fix on your own. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's working on the environment. But the only difference between that oppressive environment, saying it's an oppressive environment, a justified response, and saying that you have imposter syndrome is the assessor. So at the end of the day, it's my job to stay educated on it and, and look out for the signs. Like for I, the biggest signs that I see when people are dealing with racism related stress or like consistent hits to their black identity development or they they experience powerlessness difficulty trusting others, start isolating themselves, loss of identity, lowered self-esteem, um, traumatic stress and hopelessness. Like these are some of the key factors mm. um, that I've seen. And it's because all of these aspects are acts of violence against the Black community, right? Like racism, bias, and oppression sever the safety of an environment. And I don't think people think about it as seriously enough as they should, because it's just like, oh, well, people are code switching. No, they're masking. They're creating whole avatars. Can you imagine dealing with the world as it is now? And in addition to that, you got to wear, you got to like zip on your new body to wear 80 hours of the day, you know, of the week. Um, it's, not the, it's not the same thing. You know, code switching is language. That's like when people say, you know, you decide I'm from Philly. So I'm like, I'm not going to say John every second of the day. But like masking is, I wear my hair different. I talk different. I laugh different. My posture is different. Um, I'm worried about the brightness of my clothing. I'm trying to, you know, check to see if I'm in a safe environment. Like that's masking. And the I, I, I of that too is just like all those things just like get out the door. Like it just. That's what I'm saying. And I don't. I've never met a person, a black person, who's just code switching. I, I kid you not. And, <laughs> and black people are my people, so I stay around them. Yeah. They're masking. I, I have not met many black people that are just like, oh, I just switch my language from time to time. No, you don't. So there, so code switching is like a just language and masking is masking everything about you. So code switching is just like from like hey, what's up to like hello, how are you? And then code switching all right. Yeah. And masks think about every like layer that goes into that. And that's I mean, that's the way I see. I mean, as someone who like is a huge nerd, code refers to language and switching means back and forth. 
you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, that's that's a totally different thing. You know, masking. I think people can resonate with that more because if you remember the movie The Mask, you know, when they went, the more Jim Carrey put it on, the harder it was to take off. Yeah. The harder it was to take off. So if you are changing the whole aspect of who you are, having to conform to this aspect of that's, you know, typically a European American patriarchal aspect of work or school, and you spend like 40, 50, 60 hours a week in work and school, it becomes harder and harder to recognize who you actually are. So yeah. of course you're starting to feel more stress. And of course your weekends are starting to feel less restful. And of course you're getting the Sunday sads. And of course you're starting to isolate yourself because you don't know, you know, where you can be trusted. Of course you're having loss of identity um, because you have to sublimate your identity. Of course you're feeling like you don't have power over this because you're being forced to be in an environment that makes you change who you are. Of course you're feeling traumatic stress because you're not going to feel safe in a community that makes you have to change who you are just mm-hmm. to be accepted. Of course you're feeling difficulty trusting others because you are in an environment where you're distrust is heightened and the only way that you're able to feel trusted or respected is when you sublimate who you're who you are the only way that you're deserving of humanity is when you behave in a way that they think is okay Ooh. why would you feel trust yeah and why would you not feel cute. stressed out that's why i tell people like you deserve therapy stop thinking of therapy or as a weapon because one you don't need therapy is not going to be in everyone's journey to evolve their yeah. thought process it's not the, I, I don't think you need therapy to heal it's one of the paths i think that you do need community because you can't heal in isolation but you do deserve a space um whether that's therapy or not therapy to focus on your well-being and to be able to talk about that without being interrupted and being able to be around people where you don't have to mask right? Like think about everything that you're saying. I think this, you know, that resonates with a lot of people, you know, like loss of identity leads to confusion and self-doubt and diminished self-worth. And this is what a lot of people are walking through the world in. Why would you not need help? Explain, tell me why you wouldn't need help. Like you, you <laughs> explain you help, tell me a secret. <laughs> you know, I want you to convince me, you know, that everything that happens in the black community, like you tell me why you wouldn't benefit from any additional assistance. You tell me. And if you if you could if you could convince me, have it. A good luck. Okay, I got the words. Like <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> thinking a lot about that. I feel like it's in a way when we, like how do you get to the point where you feel safe to unmask yourself in a way? Because mm-hmm. like you said, like you spend so much of your life masking yourself. And not even yeah. just in like to work or certain spaces but sometimes you mask yourself around people who are in your community because you're just like okay will i be accepted enough in this way like will i be deemed like good enough or black enough in this aspect you know so just like trying to like overcorrect sometimes where you just want to just be yourself you just want to exist and like building up that maybe it's confidence or maybe building up like that like feeling of like it's okay just exist how i am like how mm-hmm. do you help people like get to that level of like being able to unmask you just show up t- to be like their authentic self and like what like obstacles you see people are facing with that and how they get over it. I think at first it starts with like a a good aspect of assessment. And I don't think it's things that you have to work with somebody else on. It it can also be questions that you ask yourself. Like um, if I'm concerned about powerlessness, just I want you to describe a time where you thought things were out of your control or describe relationships within your life where you felt heard and understood, right? Because if you tell me about those relationships, we can start to pick apart like, okay, so you mentioned relationships where you felt understood and heard were like in your childhood and you're 47. You know, like when is the last time you were able to be around individuals where you felt understood and heard? And when you're thinking about that childhood, what was it within those relationships with those people that made you feel understood and heard? Um, What did they do or what didn't they do, right? When you are thinking about like feeling comfortable in this space, and I think most of the time, just like you mentioned, like, how do I know someone is going to tell me that like I'm black enough or, or have an issue with me? I, I, I ask questions like, well, what is your sense of belonging to the black community overall? And in asking that, if it's high or low, tell me what contributes to the high aspect of it or the low aspect of it. And when we talk about that, we can delve deeper into, well, what are the relationships where you felt okay? What are examples of times where you didn't feel okay? Are these recent? Because sometimes it can very much be like, I've had 27 different scenarios in the past week where somebody told me I wasn't Black enough. And wow. it can also be, well, you know what? To be honest with you, I haven't had an experience where I felt uncomfortable in a minute because I make it a point to not put myself in those scenarios. Like I won't meet new people and I won't do that. And the thing about that is you have to teach people how to treat you And if you want to build friends and if you want to build relationships, you have to get close enough for them to help you and or hurt you. (laughs) 
Mm -hmm. And that's the most difficult part. It's like, I'm like, well, you know, you, you mentioned having concern within the black community and you want to build relationships in that community, but like you haven't made it a point to go to events or to engage with people that are in that community that you want to build with. You haven't made sure you have level of some access to communities or environments where you don't have to switch or, 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 or code switch your mask. Because I remember talking to a patient and they were talking about wanting to find a romantic relationship, but they didn't want to use apps and they didn't want to go to events. And I, I, I legit said, well, I hope the person who robs you is handsome. <laughs> because like, that's the only way you are going to meet this person is if they rob you. And I, I mean, and and even then we got to have a talk, honey, about like, why are yeah, we already some more flags out before? <laughs> like, you know, like, it's just like, but it's like, if you're not creating opportunities, what are they going to, they going to rob you? Like, you you want to meet your, you going to meet your new friend. You going to meet yeah, your yeah. new partner. You going to meet them when they come in and like, what? What the fuck? That is gonna make it like tell you tell me how that's gonna work. Like, oh, you don't want to go in person. Okay, you want to try the apps. You don't want to try the apps. Okay, well, let's let's hold your your, your assailant. Your assailant has a, a heart of gold, and you're you, them trying to rob you is their character arc, and like art, and it's just all sunshines and rainbows after that. Yeah, I saw where a girl fell in love with her DoorDash driver, and it was like she got love delivered to her door. But like, great, love that for her. But um. The idea of just putting yourself out there, it goes back to what you were saying about like consequences. And like, they're not negative. They're not positive. Just like you're creating action for your life and how you do that. It's by like showing up. It's by showing up. And I think there's this also, and also like felt door love was delivered to you. I'm saying something. I mean, you have to be very receptive to that because I don't even, when the, when the food is delivered to me, half the time I forget, thank God they text. Half the time I forget, you know, like, Uh oh, Oh my so gosh. Like, I'm handed to me. I'm handed to me only. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so like, that's a different aspect. I'm all for taking what you, you know, like having an actionable aspect of friendship or romantic relationship. Like I, I genuinely, I met my husband cause I was like, you're cute. Put my number in your phone. Okay. We've been at 14 years, but it's, I, and it's just because I understand that like, it's hard for anyone to talk to people. And I very much want my I'm a person who has like internal locus of control. Like I think that my happiness is in my hands. There are some things that are out of my hands, but a good chunk of it is within my hands. So like, what you know, like if my mom has always said, if, you know, you're already at no, if you don't ask, you're going to stay there. Ooh. So like, I don't have a problem just being like, I mean, you put my number in your phone. Oh, the answer is no. You're lost. Do, 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 do. You know, like, like what? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm delightful. You see what I'm saying? So it's just a like just feeling you know, feeling comfortable with that. But I think you also need to get comfortable with teaching people how to treat you. Yeah. This whole thought process of they know how to treat you. They know what my boundaries are or what my rules are, or they know that that offended me in a certain way. No, they don't. And you have to teach people how to treat you. You have to have conversations that are uncomfortable um, when it comes to friendships. Because uh, honestly, a lot of conversations that patients have been having with me lately are just like the, their friendships are evolving. Um, no. When it comes to becoming parents or moving or getting in relationships or they just don't vibe with that person anymore. That used to be their club person. They don't go to clubs anymore. They've been trying to do other outings with that friend and they're like, mm, you're boring. I guess so. <laughs> because it's just not what I'm doing. You know, like, so it's, it's all the aspect of the way relationships evolve, but you have to be direct about that. Like the issues with relationships are not, you know. It's not conflict that breaks down relationships. It's poor conflict resolution, you mm -hmm. know? So it's just like, you have to really have faith in the relationship that you have with someone to be able to handle conflict because that's what really breaks stuff down. It's not, you know, I'm I'm lying or being dishonest or I'm avoiding you because I don't really think our relationship can handle the truth. And that, that could be because when I previously gave you the truth, you lost your mind. Um, that can be because when I gave the truth to someone else, they lost their mind and I, I don't know if you can handle it. Or that could be just because I'm assuming it. But, you know, lying and being dishonest and avoidant, that means I, a lot of times, and not, but it means that I feel like our relationship can't handle the, yeah. the, the, the truth of what's going on. Um, whether it's because that's something that happened previously with you or with someone else or you're just making assumptions. And I mean, I also think that's doing the person a disservice because you have to provide them with the opportunity to disappoint you. You have to let them disappoint you. That's just what it is. You give them a chance. 
And it doesn't, you also have to let them support you, right? Like it's not always like, oh, provide them with the opportunity to support you. Also provide them with the opportunity to support you. Um, I forget who says it. That's just, no, if if I, there's this um, Hobbit saying that goes around. It's like, and, oh, if and they then wanted the to, they says, would. You, and like, yeah, it was like so popular. And I think it still is like a saying people say when they see like someone doing like something extravagant for someone. It's like, oh, if they want to, this is a sign like they actually care. But I'm learning that like, well, first, like, if they want to, like, you have to give them you the option to me. say that they want to, like, give them the chance to, like, communicate and let them know that, like, this is a place for you to show up for me. Like, ask and, like, ask and make it clear. And then if they don't show up in the way you need them to, you have an answer. And if they do, then you also have an answer. But, like, just assuming it's already a no is kind of just, like, you just are dead in the situation already. Yeah. So you mentioned with your clients that a lot of them are talking about, like, if evolving friendships and change and stuff like that and like as i'm getting mm-hmm. older i'm also starting to notice that like i'm in that place where like friends are starting to get married their friends are starting to have kids and like we're just all like going in like these like different directions but like i think the one thing that like we're good at ma- maintaining at least in my friendships is like just meeting people where they're at you know but also communicating mm-hmm. like where we are at you know like hey like this isn't like my journey right now but like i can support you in this way or like oh this probably might not be the best place for me to like show up for you in this way but Mm -hmm. i think like this idea of like sometimes i at least for me i place my identity in my friends and like oh like we see like i see myself in you or i see myself so like when things are changing either in my identity or like things are changing my friend's identity i'm sometimes i'm a bit like oh what's happening like too much change happening and then that period like isolation and questioning like that self-doubt like where i'm at in like comparison and stuff like that so like do you notice that happening in like the conversations you're having about like how they people are like navigating these like evolving friendships and like how someone else's who you're close to identity is changing and like how that impacts how your identity changes in a way? So I think as we get older, it's kind of it's it's harder to do the things that it takes to be a good friend. I, I think it's easy to be bad at most things. Um like it's, it would be easy for me to be a bad professor. It would be easy for me to be a bad scientist. It would be easy for me to be a bad parent, honestly, um, and a bad friend. But the amount of time and energy it takes to be like a good person, like a good friend, um, to check in on birthdays or um, to have conversations or to make sure our relationship is reciprocal. Like I'm not dominating the whole conversation. Like that takes time and energy, especially when you're dealing with work and school and doctor's appointments and and children and um, COVID and, uh, genocide and the development of your own identity. I think it's, I think it's honestly a result of like, we're evolving. I think when people are dealing with it, I think it's difficult to have those conversations, honestly. Um, I also think it's tough if you see your friends as a representative of yourself, um, Mm -hmm. because they have their own identity. So I think that would also be the thought process of things that are happening to them may also be indicative of things that are happening to me, which is taking on an additional responsibility. It could genuinely just be something that's happening to them, right? Um, yeah. I have I have a close friend who went through two significant life changes within a um, certain amount of time. And it caused, a sig- it, it caused a big shift within our relationship because it's just big jumps at one point yeah. in time. But during, in doing that and having the conversations about how that affected their relationship, um, it became kind of obvious, not obvious to me, but to me that like I... It, it wasn't an aspect of like it ha- it didn't have as much to do with me. I felt the result of it because, you know, I'm their friend and there's a relationship, but it was very much the changes have impacted them. And as a result, they've impacted me. But I, you know, I've been the same <laughs> you know, yeah, this, I'm, this I'm whole sure. thing. Yeah. So I think um, I think in the be- I think in the beginning, it's easy to take on that thought process of like, oh, is our relationship changing because of how I'm engaging? But it, it took time to have conversations of me just realizing like, Oh, you've gone through two big changes. And as a result of those changes, certain aspects of you have changed, which can only be expected. And that kind of has nothing to do with me, right? The only thing that has to do with me is, am I willing to be with you with the, the changes and rock with you on this new aspect of who you are? And also, am I okay with maybe our relationship changing a little bit over time? Like maybe, I don't know, before these big changes, we were able to check in more often. But now with these new changes, we can't check in as much. Does that mean that our whole entire you know, friendship has to go downhill. No, that just means that we both have to accept this change. Um, it's not always, you know, it's tough because 
no matter what, you're going to be impacted, right? Like I hate when people say don't take stuff personal and I'd be like, yeah. how am I not gonna how am I not gonna take it personal when you I'll play it personal. in my personal face? <laughs> yeah. you, you, you play it in my face. I'll what take it not personal. Like, about? You tell me I'll take personal, I'll take that personal. <laughs> like, what you talking about? Like, who is there someone else here? Is there is there someone else who should be <laughs> Is there that person? I mean, like the flu. Um, <laughs> Even in this scenario, like it's, it's, I had to acknowledge that like these changes have happened to you and rightfully so you have evolved. Um, and our relationship evolved, but that doesn't mean it's bad. That just means it's different, you know? And I think that originally I was taking it in as like, oh, what does this mean? Uh, like, does this mean that I have to change? But it's just like, girl, I don't know how to tell you this. I mean, you're impacted because you're my friend, but this ain't got nothing to do with you. Like, you know, it's about you. <laughs> you this is about like going through these huge changes and stuff is gonna change like uh yes you're affected but like i'm sorry to tell you you know like even i've had to say this statement to my husband at times um because if you know i think a lot of times people don't realize like emotional residue and emotional residue is like an aftertaste Ooh. you know you've engaged with people and say i engaged with this person at nine and they 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 really ticked me off um and i haven't let it go or something like that by like 5 p.m I've had to have conversations with my husband and be like, listen, I know it seems like I'm in a funky mood, but I need you to know it's not about you. And I'm sorry that you are going to have, you're going to be like the result of like me being shorter because I don't feel like talking and you want to talk, but like, it's not about you. I just have not gotten over something that's happened earlier because this, 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 this residue is still residuing, right? So mm-hmm. it's, I think sometimes people have to understand that like, yeah, it's tough because you're going to be impacted by it, but it's not always about you. you. Like I have to say statements like, yo, I know it seems like I'm being very short. It has nothing to do with you, right? I- I'm just hungry. And if this food don't come in 10 minutes, I'm going to flip a table. So like, maybe we just need to, well, let's just eat, you know, let's just, let's just wait till they get here. And then I can be yeah. a human being. So when it comes to friendships, like, why is there sometimes a disconnect when it becomes like between intent and impact, especially with regards to like communication and action? Um, I think uh, a lot of times when me- needs or desires or things aren't met, um, one of the best ways to to figure out what the disconnect is, is I encourage my patients to ask themselves or ask others, well, ask themselves first, what did I get versus what did I need? Because I find that like when what I got versus and what I needed are the same, we're good. But there's a disconnect when that, when what I got is different than what I needed. And I also feel as though there's difficulties with people understanding that intent and impact are not the same thing. Like, although intent and impact are versus both important concepts, they're not the same because just if I I can mistakenly step on your foot, but that doesn't mean I don't, I, that I'm just not going to apologize for hurting your foot. You'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to step on your foot, but your foot is clearly still throbbing. I messed up your sneaks and all that, right? <laughs> um, and it's also going to be two entirely yeah. different. There's blood everywhere. And it's just like, well, I didn't mean to do it. So suck it up. Man. I'm like, what the heck? Are we, are we still going to focus on this? I didn't yeah. mean to. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to see it. Golly, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but it's also going to be, it's also going to be like two different scenarios. <laughs> it's going to be two different scenarios, right? Because it's like, okay, so if we're dealing with intent, that's going to be a personal thing, right? Like I have to figure out what the heck is going on with me that I consistently keep leaving bloody feet in my wake, even though I don't mean to, like, that's a personal yeah. thing. Like I need to educate myself on like, am I, do I have an inner ear problem? Is the balance off? Like, what is wrong with me? Right. But when it comes to it, right. Like, it's like, yo, not Raquel has lost a freaking mind. Like, yo, like you cannot even hang out with her. Like I got a foot surgery. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> but the, Im- the impact is going to be a joint thing. That's going to be a, com- that's going to be a thing that we have to have between each other. Like intent is individual impact is joint because now, even though I have to deal with the aspect of like figuring out why I keep unintentionally or harming people and not really not understanding that's what's going into that. We have to deal with the harm that was caused. Like we both have to now deal with the change in our relationship as a result of that harm. And I think the most difficult aspect of that is people just, choose to focus on intent versus impact because it's like I can acknowledge that I didn't mean to but I can also acknowledge that the harm has been caused and now we have to deal with the harm of that and it sucks to deal with the fact that like sometimes people going back in relationships and they they've realized what they did was wrong and they're trying to come back and have conversations a hard part is realizing that like we can I can accept your apology and still decide not to accept you in my relationship anymore right like that's hard for a lot of people mm-hmm. to acknowledge like, oh, 
I, I, I hurt you. Um, and I, I acknowledge what I did wrong and I know how I'm going to change it going forward. And someone can say, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the fact that you came back to me and apologized for that. That did really hurt me. And I no longer want to 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 pursue this friendship or this romantic relationship with you, and that can be really hard because at the end of the day, it's it's their choice, yeah, it's someone hard. else's choice, <laughs> and and um, acknowledging the harm is difficult. Acknowledging the fact that your relationship has changed is difficult. Um, seeing that it may not go back, and and I think a lot of times, I think one of the struggles is people. I think people need to realize like your relationships, your, your healing and your growth can't hinge on someone else. Um, because someone not accepting your apology, like someone deciding that they don't want to be in a relationship with you, um, friendship, romantic or whatever, after you've worked through your healing and, and apologize, doesn't ha- that doesn't say anything about like, that doesn't mean you didn't make the right progress. That doesn't mean that you need to try harder. That doesn't mean that like the work that you did wasn't still good work. It just means that they're making a choice too. And I think sometimes people hinge their healing on other people like, well, you know, I need this person's forgiveness to go forward or I need um, this person to accept me to move forward. And your your healing can't hinge on someone else because honestly, they can drop dead tomorrow. What that mean? You just gonna stay here miserable? You want to stay on this plane miserable because they didn't accept they didn't accept your apology before they 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 dropped in. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so a lot of times it's like yeah, your your healing cannot hinge on someone else because legit. And I know it sounds crazy, but people very much can fall off the face of the earth tomorrow, and now you're still stuck here with this pain and this anguish, and you still need to work through that. Mm. No, I feel like that's like the perfect segue to like our theme of the year, which is all about like self-discovery. And I know we talked a lot about like identity and like change through identity and like this identity we have like as like we view ourselves like in our friendships and relationships. But I want to ask you like on the role, like how do you like honor your identity through like self-discovery? Like how do they go hand in hand together? I think I honor my identity and self-discovery by acknowledging the fact that my identity, there's fluidity in my identity and realizing that there's so many different dimensions to my identity and acknowledging and honoring that I deserve to go through the process of looking at what those dimensions are and being okay with that. Like there are certain things in my identity that I don't acknowledge as much, not even acknowledge anymore. They just not who I am anymore, you know, and just being like, oh, I'm happy that part of me served me when I was younger. And I'm so happy to learn about the parts of me that will serve me in the future. This whole aspect of, you know, and and being okay with grieving that too, because when it comes to identity, there's Mm -hmm. fluidity that's going to change. And you can grieve things that have you changing for the better and still be like, it's not just not what my expectation was going to be. Um, and be okay with grieving that, right? Like we've all grieved relationships that at the end of the day, we can think now that and know that it was better, but some parts of it, when it was good, it was okay. It was good. And I know that this, I know that leaving, I don't know that leaving that friendship was, uh, or that relationship was, was best for me in the long run. And I'm also grieving the fact that like, I don't know, I, I'm married and the people who I thought was going to sit next to me or not sitting next to me or, you know, the people who were in my mind when we were playing MASH, which is very old school, y'all. Um, I don't even <laughs> talk to them anymore. Um, or, um, you know, like my, you know, my career isn't, you know, it's different and I, I very much ex- just love it, but it's, it's, it's different, right? Like, so I would say just affirming the aspect of the fact that your, uh, your identity is different in so many spaces and it's meant to change um, and being okay with that and looking at the dimensions of your identity. There are places that serve me as a Black person, but not as a Black woman, as a Black woman, but not as a Black mother, as a Black mother, but not as a Black scholar, as a Black scholar, but not as a Black businesswoman you know, that, that serve, um, the aspect of who I am generationally, um, but not my intersecting identities. Like sometimes we limit our identity to age and gender and sexual orientation. And there's so much more to you. And that could be why a lot of people in this self-discovery realm can really benefit from thinking about different aspects of who you are, because there could be a gap in, your well-being, you can feel like something is missing because certain aspects of me are being fulfilled and other parts aren't, right? 
like, oh, me as a Black woman is being fulfilled, but me as a Black mom, I need some Black mom friends. That's not being fulfilled. Or yes, academia-wise, that part of me is being fulfilled, but I need somebody who also, I need friends who also listen to Too Short while driving to sessions. You know, like, I like you know, like, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I think there can also be gaps in people because, it, it, and they're feeling not fully fulfilled because, Yes, um, who I am as a mother is being fulfilled all the time, but I haven't thought about the last the last moment. I would say one of the ways I would encourage people to think about self-discovery and to really think about where that journey is going to start for them is I want you to ask yourself who you are, but you cannot use any terms that relate to who you are at that connect to a relationship. You can't tell me who you are as a mother, as a coworker, as a colleague, as a wife, as a husband, any of that. You need to tell me who you are, right? I need to know who you are, not in relation to anyone else, but yourself, because it's self-discovery, right? And if you have difficulty mm-hmm. with that, think about when was the last time you felt passionate? What were you doing? When was the la- When do you feel the most content? Um, what are you doing when you feel the most jovial? How do you like to resolve um, conflict? What makes, when's the last time you like laughed until you cried and what was happening? What really makes you just have moments of joy or even just contentment? Because it may not be joy, but you're content with where you are. Ask yourself that when it comes to self-discovery, not who I am as, oh, as a mother, I'm this. I don't want to hear it. Oh, as a friend, I'm this. Don't care. As a sister, I'm this. Absolutely not. As a mom, I'm this. Get rid of it. Who are you? What are you passionate about? How do you resolve a conflict? What are hobbies you enjoy? Not hobbies that you monetize. What is something that you like doing? Because it's about mm-hmm. you. And I think we're too, it's, it's so hard to think about yourself outside a relationship to others, especially as Black people, because a lot of times we only have that aspect of tangible, like, what can I provide? Sure, Even buddy. hobbies. Like, I have hobbies and people will be like, oh, you can sell that. I'm not monetizing anything. This is just for fun. Okay? <laughs> this is Please. just for fun. Right. So I would encourage people in that self-discovery journey, ask yourself the questions about like, who are you? But don't use any any terms that have to do with your relationship to someone else, just about yourself. Um, And I feel like that would that would start you on a good journey. And if you don't have any answers, that's going to start you on another journey. Right. Because it's just like, I don't know. When was the last time I did something for fun? When's the last time I thought about when I was content? Mm. When's the last time I thought about myself outside of motherhood or, you know, parenthood or caregiving or my relationship or my job? Like, and it can be scary because a lot of times people talk about fight or flight, like, but there's also, there's a numbing, there's a, there's a freeze response. And that's what a lot of people engage in like numbing behaviors that take you outside of the reality. And that's what people can be excessive use of substances or sexual relationships or risky behaviors or overworking. Because when you stay busy, you don't have to really know yourself. You just know your tasks. And I think that that's, that, Mm. that, that's important to like focus on when it comes to self-discovery. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna be thinking about that. I'm gonna be processing that and asking myself those questions. I will. <laughs> I'm just gonna write that down. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Like this conversation has been so healing and fulfilling and pouring into all the cups. But before we leave, where can people find you? What? How can people support you? Please let us know. So um, my social media is Raquel Martin PhD everywhere. R-A-Q-U-E-L Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N PhD. That's at Instagram. That's at LinkedIn. That's at Facebook. That's at um, Instagram. Um, I have a podcast, Mind Your Mental Podcast, which focuses on the Black experience and mental health and well-being. Uh, I also do speaking engagements on things like mental health and well-being. And I have a mental health community called the Mind Your Mental Community. The same name as my podcast. My podcast is called Mind Your mm-hmm. Mental. My community is called Mind Your Mental. Um, and every single month we have a webinar that's focused on a topic like this month's topic is relationship to others. Last month's topic was shame and guilt. The month before that was goals. Um, we do live sessions, um, live Q&A. And I also have a clinician's corner because a lot of the people in community are clinicians. So we talk about stuff like that. Um, we have a book club. And then we also have a community-only podcast where people ask me questions and I answer them via podcast in addition to the forums. Um, and we do that every month. <laughs> Y'all say like, as, as I'm saying it, I'm like, oh, oh so we do that every month. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's still going. 
Did you still go? Yeah. <laughs> we do. We do. We do it every month. Every month we have a book club. This month's book club click is um, is by Nedra Tawab, and it's um, set boundaries, found peace. The topic oh, of, of the month is relationships. Love that. Others. Um, and the last, so the last podcast question that a person sent in was about grieving expectations. And uh, I don't know what the next one is going to be. People mm-hmm. send me questions in the community and I just answer them and people benefit from them. And yeah. Amazing. Well, I know people are going to benefit from this podcast and from everything you're saying. Task is figure out who you are without the relationship of other people. So I'm going to work on that and we're going to yeah. move on. But yeah, because it's called so self-discovery. Much. It's not called like self-discovery. You know, group it's discovery. Not, like, Co-ed it's not, discovery. <laughs> it's not group discovery. Because you know, I mean, you you will go through processes of your identity in that realm. Any, you know, what like who am I as a mom? Who is I am as a partner? But like, who am I? Like, who am I? Like, you know, who am, that's it. Like, and I was really thinking, I was like, who am I? Like, legit, who am I? Well, I'm gonna be figuring that out. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Raquel. It's been truly amazing. Thank you all for joining us for a very special episode of The Unfolding, presented by the Love and Foundation. At the Love and Foundation, we are committed to showing up for communities of color in unique and powerful ways, with a particular focus on Black women and girls. Our resources and initiatives are collaborative, and they prioritize opportunity, access, validation, and healing. Since our founding, the Therapy Fund has provided financial support for therapy to over 13,000 Black women, girls, and non-binary individuals across the country. This year, our goal is to provide free therapy to at least 6,000 more. If you'd like to join us and invest in generational change, visit our website at theloveandfoundation.org for ways to give. To stay updated on new episodes and any future programming, follow us on Instagram and Meta, or check out our website at theloveandfoundation.org.